So the second step was to scale up further and go into a MOOC. So we created a MOOC on edX for in-service teachers, teachers who are already working as teachers. Um, and oh, again, we had lots of challenges. How do you preserve the richness of the, the small groups, the interaction, the production, the sharing of experiences and ideas, while at the same ta time taking advantage of the amazing richness of thousands of teachers from all around the world? And how do you do that in a very restrictive technological environment of edX, which some of you are familiar with? Okay, so this was the MOOC that ran uh, in the summer of 2015 on edX, Teaching with Technology Inquiry. Initially, it started as a collaboration between our university and a lab high school. So you see the, the Jim Slada, who was the professor at the University of Toronto, and Rosemary Evans, who was the principal at the University of Toronto Schools, which is a high school affiliated which meant that we got very nice combination of academic and, pra and uh, practitioner perspectives. So this is my longest slide, but just to give you a context of what we were trying to achieve and what those were some of the challenges. So already from the university course, we knew that this would be very heterogeneous populations. They would all more or less be teachers, but a primary school arts teacher, a high school physics teacher, um, a middle school um, English literature teacher, these have different needs, they use different tools, they have different uh, ways of knowing. Uh, of course, as we all know, people coming into MOOCs have very different levels of motivation and commitment and want to get different things out of the courses. And in our particular case, we really wanted the students to foster this uh, community of knowledge where not only did they collaborate uh, in order to understand something very specific, but where they felt that their own experiences and ideas were consequential to the course, and that they were contributing to something larger. And in short, we wanted the students to experience the kind of pedagogy that we wanted them to learn. We want them to, sh to learn that technology can be transformative in the way that students learn together. We can't just show them a bunch of videos. It's not effective. Uh, these were all professional <coughs> teachers, so we wanted to make the learning as situated and relevant to their professional life as possible, uh, because a common problem with professional development is that it's seen as very theoretical and very difficult to, to take back into the classroom. Of course, with a MOOC, it's a fully online, asynchronous environment, and we're on the edX platform, which has its own limitations. Okay. <coughs> so what did we actually do? So, our first maybe tiny innovation was that we thought six weeks is a very short time to create this epistemic understanding of uh, ourselves as community of learners, right? Um, but we actually have this gap between the time when people sign up for a MOOC and when the MOOC actually starts. And we didn't want to waste that time. So we said, once you sign up for the MOOC, please come into the teacher's lounge and hang out with all the other teachers while you wait for the MOOC to start. And by the way, let us know something about you that can help us plan the MOOC better. One of the important things that we found out was that we had a huge population of university uh, uh, people working in universities and in museums and informal learning. We had not designed the course around that at all. It was really focused on primary, secondary, high school. But knowing that in advance allowed us to, to make some kind of space for, for those people. Um, and then we also wanted students to start contributing resources. So this is the kind of crowdsourcing aspect where we say it's amazing that we have, so in total we had about 8,000 people who signed up. We had about 2,000 people that we call active, and I'll talk about what that means. But that means we have 2,000, most of these were teaching professionals. Um, and so this is an incredible resource. We want to take advantage of that. And so we started out by asking them, who are you, okay? And so we said, okay, we don't want to use any of your personal data, but we need to refer to you somehow, so what do you want us to call you? And that name will be public within the MOOC, but you choose that name. And then we want to know who are you, what are you teaching, what age group, what are your feedback from all of these, uh, so that we could tell immediately uh, what students were signing up, what their interests were, how things were going. Uh, the way this was done technically, and I can talk more in detail if anyone's interested afterwards, but basically we use something called LTI, which is a way of plugging things into edX or very many other platforms. Problem with LTI is that it gives you almost nothing for free. 
It's basically an iframe or a full web page, and you get a, a unique ID per student. And that, that idea is consistent every time the same student comes, but you know nothing about that student. Uh, but because we asked the students, who are you, the first time they logged in, next time we can say, hi, Jim. We know you're Jim because you told us, and it's the same unique ID. So because of all these different components were served by the same system, we could manage this kind of student model where we knew that you're Jim, but we also know that you're teaching physics in high school. We know that you've joined this group. We know that you've seen these resources or contributed these other resources, right? So all of this is happening on our own servers, not on edX. But we were still able to integrate these pieces very tightly with the edX navigation, which you'll see. And I think that was an important point uh, in order to avoid uh, students being lost. Because if you have a completely different environment, uh, you click a link and then now suddenly you're in some kind of a social platform, you know, and then you forget where you're supposed to be. So this was all integrated with edX. So again, we know who the students are, they have tags, we can start, you know, clustering them. And this is all, this is not after the course was done, this was before the course even started, right? So you see these graphs in papers, but oftentimes it's done when the course is over and we start understanding it. At this point, we were able to do it even before the course has started. So here you see an example of an LTI component that's integrated. You see, this is the very familiar edX navigation system. And here you have a form that is hosted on our server that stores the data on our server. But for the student, there's nothing mystical about this. You know, they click video, they click quiz, they click form, okay, I'm gonna fill out a resource that is useful to me. Okay, if you're a physics teacher, you have some kind of simulation, there's some kind of video, online textbook that you think is really useful. It takes you a few minutes to share that with other people. It's not a big commitment. Um, and then we ask them, what kind of a resource is this? Is it a discipline-specific resource? Okay, it's a physics simulation. It's not so interesting to the arts teacher. But Google Docs could be used by very many different disciplines in different ways. And so by clicking there, you determine whether this resource will be shown to only the people in your group or to the whole, the whole MOOC population. So now we're starting the MOOC. We haven't even started. This is week one. We've already found out who the people are, and we know something about their interests, and they've already started populating this knowledge base. And hopefully the act of doing that also starts them thinking that this is a MOOC where they will be participating and contributing. So we had this kind of weekly learning script because we want to give some consistency. You start by watching videos, it's a MOOC, and people like videos. Then you do a personal reflection, not shared with anyone. Then we had these uh, special interest groups. So these were groups of two to 300 people that were designed to group people based on their a the age of students they're teaching, high school, primary school, and the subject area. Um, and here we integrated the cohort functionality of edX with all of the functionality that we had on our own server. Then you did a self-assessment of the discussion. And then you did the inquiry activities, and that's where a lot of the really fun stuff was happening. So that last block is what I'm gonna talk mostly about. But the videos were good. Um, because we had this collaboration with the high school, we were able to, so we had started with kind of the fire, fireplace chat, which was recorded each week where you could reflect on what happened in the discussions last week. Then you had a pre-recorded theoretical introduction um, by, by Jim Slada. Then you had the headmaster's perspective, who said this is how we implement inquiry learning in physics, in, in math, in English, in our school. This is how we train our teachers. These are the things we think of as practitioners. Then you have the actual classroom teachers. And often this video was blended with authentic footage from their classrooms, where they were actually doing different kinds of inquiry learning tasks. Because this was a lab school, we were able to get permissions from teachers to post authentic student footage, which is not common, but which I think really, really helped um, you know, the value. So already there, if you're just going there and watching the videos, I would say it's a useful resource. But of course, we want to go much further. So you remember that before the course even started, people were submitting these resources, okay? Now we're in the first week, we did the videos, the personal reflection, a discussion in these groups, and now we're coming to the inquiry tasks. And we're telling them, hey, your colleagues have submitted all these resources. Could you take a moment to rate them, 
and comment on them. And the comments are the most important. How would you use this in your classroom? Again, this is something that takes a few minutes of your time. It's not very demanding, and hopefully it's something interesting, because these resources have been selected to be relevant to your teaching role. They're not random. But again, with 2,000 teachers spending a few minutes on this, we now have a very useful resource. We have thousands of resources ranked, tagged, uh, with comments about how they could be used in different contexts that students can explore uh, using different interfaces. Okay? And so this is something that would be very difficult to do if you didn't have this custom technology, but still it's very integrated into the edX interface. So there's nothing confusing, hopefully, uh, for the students about what they're supposed to do. So already we have covered some of this, this crowd, you know, what are some of the things we can do that we can do with 2,000 people that we couldn't do in the same way with 20 people. However, there's a lot of really big value to this small, tight, into uh, collaboration. I mean, I come from computer-supported collaborative learning, where we spend all of our lives researching kind of the magic that happens when you have two people or five people coming together and, and really working deeply on something. And we wanted to see if we could bring that into the MOOC as well. But we knew that not everyone would be willing to commit. Um, so we were very inspired by this uh, DAL MOOC, Digital Analytics and Learning MOOC, that came um, before us. They had this concept of the blue pill or the red pill from Matrix. So you can kind of choose, you know, do you want to do the kind of plain vanilla MOOC or do you want to di di uh, dig down? And we actually made the choice to say, so here I told you there was about 8,000 people who signed up to the MOOC, okay? There was about 2,000 who ever did any of the interactive exercises. And there were 400 who said, yes, I want to do the design track. The design track, you got no credit for it. Okay, so you could do the foundation track, you, you had to do peer review, you had to submit resources, you had to do these kind of things, but, and you would get 100%, I mean, if you did well, um, and statement of accomplishment, everything. This was purely personal interest and hopefully professional interest, because the idea was to make this very relevant to your own work. Okay, so this was very much adapted from the university course, except in the university course everyone has to do this because it's for credit. Um, so the idea was we're going to design a lesson or a set of lessons around technology and inquiry in your discipline area. It should be something that you're doing that maybe is, is troubling to you, that students have a hard time learning. And we started this week one. So this is not the, you know, you learn lots for six weeks and then you go off and write your final exam or, or final project. This is something that we started in week one and we scaffolded it throughout the entire course. It was a red kind of thread guiding everything. Um, Yes, and we started by bringing in information from a previous cohort. So this is uh, the, uh, lesson designs from the university students who have taken the university course previously that we made available to the MOOC students to start kind of the brainstorming. And, and this was part of our idea of connecting this course, you know, bringing in resources from previous generations and then eventually uh, sharing some of the outcomes of the students with future generations. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but suffice to say that uh, some of the things that you can do in a class very, very quickly when it comes to organizing people in groups and stuff like that uh, becomes very much more difficult in an online MOOC where people log in at different times. So we had to do some uh, design around that. But I'm going to go to... now that we So basically we asked students to suggest topics and we managed to get them into groups. Now what? How do you have these people who have never met each other, who are not online at the same time, to work together in this very collaborative task? And so, we wanted, so I wanted to design an interface that could support this. And so I call this the collaborative workbench. The idea was to put all the tools that the students would need on the same page. Again, to, to uh, avoid this kind of um, confusion and to support uh, collaboration. So you have a chat here. It's all that you're automatically logged in because, again, we know who you are. We know which group you're part of. So when you go to this activity, you're logged in. It tells you the other students and whether they're online or not. And this is persistent. So it's a chat, but it's also a notice board because you can put something here. People log on next day and they can put something back. Um, then you have these tabs, and they changed a bit each week. Here you have the welcome. This was new each week. So it said, hey, welcome to week three. Uh, this week we're going to talk about this. We hope that you work on these parts of your design. Uh, then we had an etherpad embedded, and this was your scratch pad. This was private to the group, 
Again, we seeded this with some prompts every week, and you could always go back and look at the pads from previous weeks. So this was where you would do some of the, you know, the, the kind of thinking work. And then we had a wiki that was again embedded, which was your window to the world. So this would always be exposed to the outside world, and is what people would do peer review on. Then we also added some other tools to, to communicate. Now, the idea was we have this strand of people who want to do videos, they want to do a little bit of crowd stuff with submitting resources, and then we have these people who want to do really in-depth collaborative work. On the one hand, can we cater to both? Can we ensure that both have a really good experience? But on the other hand, can we actually make sure that they benefit from each other? That the course is better because you have both of these strands. And so we have this interdependence where you start by feeding in lots of ideas into the design groups. You have the resources, you have the previous lessons with comments, and then you have this cycle of peer review. And the way we did peer review was we don't care if it's good or bad because it's in progress. We care how it can get better, right? So we, again, would have questions each week. Like here, for example, we say, um, how could student-generated content be relevant to this design? Because they've been just learning about student-generated content in this week. And uh, then you would gather all these feedback because there were more people doing the, the foundation strand than the design strand. One group might get 10, 20 comments into their design every week, which hopefully, and we're planning a paper on actually looking at more uptake, to what extent those comments were uh, consequential for editing. Um, but hopefully it was at least motivating to see that people are reading your work. And hopefully it was also useful for the learning of those people in the foundation strand to, to kind of fishbowl these people who are doing the collaborative work and see how it's developing, which was our idea. Uh, so very briefly, we wanted the, because this was a, an incredible community, and we wanted the course to kind of you know, celebrate uh, the ending and not just post a message saying, yeah, it's over, thank you, see you next year. So again, we designed a little interface. This is basically Google Hangout on air, embedded. So millions of people can watch it, not that we had millions. But here we have a chat so that they can talk to each other. Here we have something inspired by Google Moderator where you can post a question and people can vote it up. So the person who's talking only needs to look at the top question. Doesn't need to follow the chat or the Twitter stream. And when you've answered that question, you can archive it and goes to the bottom and the next question pops up. And the students uh, who were there really loved it. The this was in the last week, so there was 200 people who showed up, but they were very happy about it. So this is my last slide, and uh, it's a lot, <laughs> but I will be happy to give you a, uh, a digital copy of this and everything else. So the, so the idea of this, I think the key... Yes, I know. <laughs> the key idea here is really to integrate these long-ranging scripts, these things that happen across the course, with the weekly themes, okay? So imagine in week three, you're doing collaborative learning. You start out by watching some videos about collaborative learning from the academic perspective, from the practitioner perspective. You do an individual reflection on what collaborative meaning means to you. You go into your group of physics teachers in high school and you discuss in the discussion forum what does collaborative learning look like for you guys. Then you go and look at a lesson design in progress and you're asked how could this better employ collaborative learning. And finally, if you're in the lesson design group, you go into your lesson design and you start adding more collaborative learning to your project. So that's basically a way of tying together all of these things. Thank you. So, so the special interest groups, um, as I said, were groups of two to 300 people. Um, we designed them based on, on the demographic data that we collected from students at the beginning, so their interests, their teacher, teachings, uh, and so on. But we let them choose, actually, their own groups, because we thought we, we don't want to place you, um, you know, by force. 
And the, the way they worked is we used the cohort functionality on edX so that in the discussion forum, you would only be discussing with the people in your own group. But then we also used it on our platform so that you could only peer review um, lesson designs in your own group. You would see resources mainly from your own group and so on. So it was kind of a, a separate community. Um, many, many parallel communities. Hi, Dana Doyle with MIT. Um, so we have a we have kind of a hit or miss with peer review. So I'm curious, like, how did you use the peer review tool in edX, or it looked like you had it in the wiki. So how did you, like, how complicated was that, and how successful was the peer review? I mean, it's, since it's so integral to the course, I figure it must have worked out. But I'm just curious what improvements you made and how you got it to work well. So yeah, we didn't use the edX peer review tool because it makes too many assumptions about you know you have to submit something to get a peer review and these kind of things. Whereas we wanted lots of people to give peer review to a few people. Um, also, as I said, this was not uh, assessing something, saying where there was good or bad. Um, which I'm doubting anyway. It has to be done very, very carefully. And anyway, it wasn't what we were interested in. We wanted people to bring in new ideas. Um, how successful, and, and so we built all the technology ourselves. Um, I can tell you more details if you're interested. How successful it is, I mean, people certainly used it. Uh, groups did get a fair amount of, of peer review each week. I think that it hopefully was motivating. Um, whether it was useful to them, uh, that's something we're looking at for a future paper. Uh, where we're going to do a bit more kind of um, detailed analysis. Um, so, yeah. 